Now I'm thrilled to welcome home and to introduce today's speaker, Jeff Ballou. Jeff is the 110th and the immediate past president of the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. He is currently one of three full-time America's News Editors for Al Jazeera Media Network's English Language Channel. A Pittsburgh native, he has been a journalist for nearly three decades. The profession has honored him with an Emmy and other accolades. Jeff graduated from Penn State in 1990 with a bachelor's degree in journalism and a minor in African American studies. He has served the Penn State alumni community in several capacities as a past member of alumni council and as a volunteer on the advisory boards of the Donald P. Belisario College of Communications, the Greater Allegheny Campus, and the Metro DC chapter. Additionally, Jeff is a member of several alumni interest groups, including THON, the African American Alumni Organization of Washington, D.C., and the Penn State Media Association. Let's give a big Happy Valley homecoming welcome to Jeff Blue. Okay, is this thing on? Oh. Sound kind of quiet. We are. We are. We are. Thank you. Yes, I do know the count. <laughs> there are people who do not. Um, wow, it's always an honor to come home to your alma mater, and especially on homecoming. Uh, and it's an honor to be asked. To, to participate in the Huddle of the Faculty series. Now, before we jump into the title about the First Amendment, I think one group of people that have been able to explain the First Amendment or explain the Constitution better than I ever could is one of my favorite cartoons, and that's Schoolhouse Rock. <laughs> You're probably thinking, why is he using Schoolhouse Rock? Because I think it's, it's one of the most brilliantly produced cartoons that very simply understands and communicates how this great experiment called America came together. So I'm gonna play this. Hey, do you know about the USA? Do you know about the government? Can you tell me about the Constitution? Hey, learn about the USA. In 1787, I'm told our founding fathers did agree to write a list of principles for keeping people free. The USA was just starting out a whole brand new country. And so our people spelled it out, the things that we should be. And they put those principles down on paper and called it the Constitution. And it's been helping us run our country ever since then. The first part of the Constitution is called the Preamble and tells what those founding fathers set out to do. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility. like this. We the people, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. 
this constitution for the United States of America, for the United States of America. I think we all have heard this at some point in our childhood. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. I don't think there's a person in this room that either hasn't said it, or heard it, or maybe even felt it. <laughs> well, we all know that you know, when we were kids, sometimes things, uh, you would tease each other and say something like that. And this phrase matured over time, I think, it made its way into other related sort of sayings. My former first lady and UN ambassador, Eleanor Roosevelt, once said, no one can make me feel inferior without my consent. But I think this one fits this crowd. Losing, is a game, losing a game is heartbreaking. Losing your sense of excellence or worth is a tragedy. Late coach Joe Paterno said that one. So you see, things evolve, but still keep a theme. You know, insults have long been the stuff of childhood. Comedy in some corners of political debate, but you know, however, the way some of us conduct ourselves in the various spaces in the public square and elsewhere in society have sort of devolved us into a culture where civility has been the convenient casualty of tearing each other down. Think about the last time you read the comments section online in the news source of your choice. Kind of ugly, huh? Think about the last Facebook debate you had or observed. Think about how our own Penn State family tore itself apart several years ago over the second mild child sex abuse scandal. But that was exposed by reporting. That little part of the First Amendment says of the press. That was us. And yes, free speech is a precious thing, and yet we saw civility rail against that sense of free speech when we confirmed Justice Kavanaugh a couple of weeks ago. And when we start thinking about where we are, it should give us pause. It seems that the greatest tools that can keep us connected in that foundational, lovely cartoon that talks about how hard we fought to put this country together, have been weaponized. Trust in our institutions shattered. A whole lot of folks think what I do for a living, the news, the news that we consume is, is, is fake. And despise even more that when we consider that you know, hate speech, you know, when it's something against race or ethnicity or gender, or sexual orientation. Some people think the news is worse than hate speech. Seriously. And even as we gather for this huddle, the fiance of one of my colleagues, Jamel Khashoggi, you've probably read about him, the Washington Post columnist who's missing, and some people think he's dead because he was probably reportedly but not quite confirmed, but possibly kidnapped, dismembered, a hit put on him by members of the Saudi royal family, just for doing his job. Just imagine one day your son, your daughter, your brother, your sister, your niece, your nephew, your grandchild goes down to the post office or the corner store and never comes back. That's what happened with Jamal's fiance. So I think we have, probably have a little bit of cleaning up to do on aisle five, so to speak, in civility. In fact, I'm going to show you one other thing from somebody who you might know. This guy, Speaker of the House. Who was recently at, well, you guessed it, the Thank National Press much. Club. That's nice. I pre is this your phone? Is it? Okay, there. Yeah, Don't make you lose your phone. Yeah. Uh, Andrea, thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And um, uh, 
Um, I was hoping to see Craig Gilbert here, isn't it? His office is like right around the corner and he couldn't even make it here. So make sure you give him a hard time for me. I, I appreciate He had some it. remarks about freedom um, of the press. First off, uh, I want to um, just start off by saying that one of the most valuable things that we have in a democracy is a spirited exchange of ideas. And by celebrating the First Amendment, this organization plays a vital, vital role in civic dialogue here and around the world, and I want to thank each and every one of you for your part in playing that role. I mean that very sincerely. Um, you know what? Uh, as you sort of mentioned it, I'm more of a policy guy. And I'm going to skip ahead to the um, end when we asked about the asked I mean, about just the last two weeks, uh, the politics about, and civility. Mr. Speaker, Bob Wiener and uh, Wiener Public News op-eds and former House staffer for 16 years. Mm. Um, you have been in a very big box with the politics of conduct. I'm, sorry, I'm looking up, working on there. Coming from the White House. Can we you crank that up? Against it periodically. Do you think that's here to stay? Is that a model that's yeah. going to stay with our national Good politics? Question. Or what can we do about it to make it not happen? This is also something I want to spend some time thinking about when I'm this kind of job. You don't have a lot of time to think about these bigger effects and these bigger things. Uh, I worry about this a lot. Um, the poli I mean, just the last two weeks, uh, the politics, the incentive in politics is invective, it's outrage, it's hysteria. And the 21st century technology system that we are experiencing with Who can't social hear that? media, cable news, ratings chasing, um, it fuels tribalism and identity politics. As conservatives, we abhor it. We abhor and Can't abhor boost it more. identity politics. We used to think it was an Alinsky thing for the left. Now the right practices it. What I'll do is I'll stop so this down. It's being practiced on both sides. The speaker, essentially, uh, as you know, he's on his way out the door. And he lamented about the state of our civility and the state of our politics and the state of how uh, our institutions are under assault and wanting us to, to come back together and work harder at making this experiment we call America a better one. I talked about the First Amendment, and I'm gonna, Carly's coming back up here to keep here. This one? Perfect. All right. With that sense of wanting to honor our founding documents, and specifically, I'm here to talk about the First Amendment, and, and more importantly, or more to the point, a free and independent press, which is part of that. A lot of things have happened in our American life, and then that's not just in the past couple of years. I remember when I covered the pres President Clinton in the early 90s, I thought things were bad then. <laughs> and what we have is had this steady, sort of growing cesspool where things that we thought were simple and calm and civil have been turned against each other. I remember starting in talk radio, where that was, the thing about talk radio was it was calm. This is in the 1980s. And it was listening to sports scores, recipes, the latest doings in City Hall. Now it's just a screaming match. And we have to ask ourselves, what happened to us? And what happened to this wonderful thing called the First Amendment? There's that, what is that phrase? It's a republic if you can keep it. <laughs> the museum, how many of you have been to the museum in Washington? If you haven't, it's a beautiful place. They have an institute that looks at the First Amendment every year. And they have a report. And this year, the survey reveals that Americans consider, as I said earlier, 
fake, so-called fake news more objectionable than hate speech. So let's define terms here. What people call fake news is not the absence of facts. That's fake. Most people in our political dialogue, in our, in our national dialogue, call stories they don't like that are based in fact fake news. What does that do? If you, if you spend time saying the tax system is trash, that our health care system is in free fall, if you spend time saying that our financial markets are no good and that your retirements are going to be threatened, if you keep throwing more and more wood onto the fire, then people are going to trust your institutions less and less. That's not responsible dialogue. It's free speech, but not necessarily responsible speech. And it makes the way so that when people come into office on any level, not just the White House, they can say whatever they want, do whatever they want, and people have such have washed themselves of these institutions, then where's the belief? Where are our moorings as a society? Think about that for a moment. Now, quoting this survey about free speech and about the First Amendment, 83% of respondents agree that social media companies, Facebook, Twitter, all of those folks should remove false information compared to 72% who agreed such companies should remove hate speech. Now, I'm not against Facebook and Twitter cleaning up their act, but why has the finger got to be pointed at them, just at them? Think about why we aren't doing it ourselves. Why aren't we policing our own neighborhood, so to speak? We have block captains. We have school boards and town councils when we want to have better schools and we want to have cleaner streets. Can't be a latchkey situation where you say, okay, Facebook, you, you do it, but we're still going to over here and still argue and still throw stuff into the cesspool and make it bigger and deeper and smellier. But there is some good news. Three out of four Americans are supportive of the First Amendment, thank God, <laughs> and the freedom that it guarantees. Here's the depressing part, folks. Unfortunately, most Americans are generally aware, unaware of what the freedoms the First Amer Amendment guarantees. Think about that. More than one-third of respondents could not name a single freedom guaranteed by the First Amendment. Not this crowd. You're the smart folks. <laughs> Another third of the respondents were only able to name one, and only one respondent out of the 1,009 people surveyed was able to correctly name all five freedoms guaranteed by the First Amendment. And many more, 9%, thought that the First Amendment guaranteed the right to bear arms, a right that's actually guaranteed by the Second Amendment. Really? So, what are the five freedoms? Anybody? Speech? Press? Religion? Assembly? Bingo! This crowd gets a gold star. <laughs> You're doing better than those people who got surveyed. So we're ahead of the game. Thank you. You know, I thought we were supposed to be a, sm you know, a group of smart Americans. This group is smart. We're, we're smart because we're Penn Staters. And we use the marketplace and our wonderful brains to expel the stuff that doesn't pass the smell test. But any, when you think about the news, 
you have to think about things that you depend upon. If the news is so fake, why do you turn to it for time, temperature, and traffic? Why do you find out if your schools are open or closed? Whether your health and fitness center is open or closed? Whether or not you can actually get from point A to point B if there's too much snow or there's too much construction? And oh, and then there's that wonderful thing called climate change. If you think that's fake, I'd like you to walk across campus to the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences and ask them. I think they have an answer for you. It's kind of true. And since the most famous product of the College of Earth and Mineral Sciences is a little thing called AccuWeather, I, don't, I think they're going to debate you kind of furiously. So what are the three branches of government, folks? Legislative, executive, judicial. You, know, you have no idea how many people in the last Constitution survey couldn't even name that. And there's the last Constitution survey said that most people couldn't name all nine, let alone maybe even one of the sitting Supreme Court justices. Forget about the one we just appointed. I'm not trying to depress you all morning. I swear I am not. But it's important to understand this thing that we, this crucial, this precious thing we have called the Constitution, and specifically the Bill of Rights and specifically the First Amendment. So, who's the real winner? Maybe, I, don't, I wish I had a blanket to give away. Who could, who could actually name the word, who can actually name the wording of the First Amendment? Kevin and Randy, you don't count because you're lawyers. All right. Bill of Rights, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Yeah, I love this one <laughs> for obvious reasons the right of the people to peacefully assemble and petition the government for a redress of grievances. So if you really study the First Amendment, it really pertains to the government. Because a lot of us love to say a lot of things in this wonderful society, but you can't say just anything without consequences. Most of us know, and from grade school, from civics, that you can't yell fire in a crowded theater. So you can't endanger your fellow human being. You can protest peacefully, even if it's something that boils your blood, like, you know, the KKK marching, marching down your street. Congress can't pass laws to inhibit a free press or enshrine official religion for the country. But they can, and they can't nor can they prevent you from worshiping how you so choose. That's why we came, that's why this country was founded in part, to escape tyranny. There's a Schoolhouse Rock cartoon for that too, but we don't have time for that today. You can ask your government to change how it does business. You saw that on full display during the Kavanaugh hearings, all the protests that happened. Because you pay for it, you vote for it, but there are cons other consequences. You can't cyber bully somebody just be and then because you just uh, disagree with them and then turn around because they can turn around and press charges. There are consequences to speech, folks. Assuming you haven't already been tried and acquitted for a crime, you can't admit to one in the name of free speech and think you won't be arrested. And no, you cannot try to relive the Mifflin Street and Beaver Stadium in the name of free expression and think you won't get arrested for public indecency. I don't know how many of you tried that when you were undergrads. Now, getting back to that survey. In the past year, the President of the United States has railed against many people in my profession for their critical coverage of his administration. But this same survey show, results show that an increasing number of us believe 
that the press should play that critical role. 74% of us, as a matter of fact, up from 68 from last year, think that it's important for, the, for journalists to serve as a watchdog on the government. A majority of us don't think the president should have the authority to deny press credentials to any news outlet he chooses. And we also hold, want to believe that journalists should hold themselves to high ethical standards, agreeing that it's necessary for us, like any profession, to disclose our conflicts of interest. This brings up a wonderful anecdote. When I, when I was National Press Club president last year, within, I think, a day of my of assuming office, I was, a, I was inaugurated a week before President Trump. Um, so I started first, so I was expecting, you know, an apple pie, some sugar at my door. The, the press club and the White House are two, two blocks apart, just to let you know, for logistical purposes. But the first thing I got were people that couldn't cover his inauguration. Phone was ringing off the hook within an hour of me getting the gavel. So I had to go protest the presidential inaugural committee and call. I happen to know Sean Spicer. I've known him for 20 years. So I had to call him <laughs> and say, hey, my folks are trying to cover your president-elect. What gives? And that started a very, very long year for me. <laughs> I thought it was going to be great, interviewing wonderful people from Misty Copeland to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, but no, I had to defend my profession for almost 24-7, 365. And all the hate mail and the tweets and the death threats that came with it. I guess I didn't get that pie after all, huh? So the fever pitch that's afoot here, think about it. I've seen, last year I saw mayors who threw reporters out of the room, taxpayer funded space because they asked them questions they didn't like. That happened in Baltimore. I watched the legislature in North Carolina purge the whole chamber of people, citizens, like everybody in this room who want to see their lawmakers at work, throw everybody out the chamber, throw the reporters out so they could pass laws that could kneecap the incoming government because it was a Republican legislature, an incoming Democratic governor, and they wanted to really stick it to them. And they didn't want anybody to see what they were doing. Really? I don't care what party you are. Your citizens have a right to watch you work. So that didn't go over too well, by the way. I watched my colleague Ben Jacobs, who was, you probably heard about this incident, who was covering a wealthy man in Montana named Greg Gianforte. He's a, Greg is a pretty tall guy, close to six feet. Ben Jacobs is a, a 20, late 20 something young man, is not that tall. Greg picked him up and body slammed him, broke his glasses. He still got elected to Congress, by the way. And he still, and, he, and it took weeks for him to get an apology out of the congressman elect. Weeks. Not hours, not days, weeks. And only after the Committee to Protect Journalists and the National Press Club and a bunch of other organizations lit up his phones and went to his office and said, you really? You're going to assault somebody because he asked you a question about your campaign that you didn't like? He didn't ask you if you murdered somebody. <laughs> so we have to be careful about our institutions, and we have to be careful about how they're demeaned, and we have to be careful about the laws, and we have to really be careful about, be there are people out there becoming willfully ignorant about the very basic rules of the road that run this country. So let me tell you about what journalists really do. Compared to what you may see 
in the common discussion. When we do a story, it has to have these five elements. Who, what, where, when, why, and how. Information we gather has to pass that test. And it has to have context. It has to have a sense of, why do I care about this story? Is it factual? Did it happen before? What happened then? Who's involved? Who's affected? What's, what's happening here? And if it doesn't have these things, if you aren't vetting, the, the key word here is vetting, you can't just throw stuff out there. If you're not vetting something, it's not journalism. If you're not rigorously testing something if it's true, it's not journalism. Sadly, because people think asking questions, sometimes hard questions, is a bad thing. They like to jail, harass, and um, beat up, and sometimes kill journalists. These numbers, they say in sports, numbers never lie. 262 of my colleagues are currently in jail for doing what I do every day. Turkey, you've heard that country in the news lately. Number one jailer, followed by China and Egypt. Really don't care much about us. You know, there are a couple of things I want to talk about tied to this a bit. You've heard the president talk and others talk about their disdain for anonymous sources. Well, before, there's this little thing that made, there are two things that made anonymous sources important. One, in that there was a reporter named Earl Caldwell who was sent by the New York Times to do reporting on the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense in the early 1970s. And the FBI wanted him to cough up his sources. And he said no. And that went all the way to the Supreme Court. And that was the first of many tests about whether or not reporters should reveal their sources. And that made it very possible for a famous court case called Bansberg versus Hayes, the New York Times versus Sullivan. And this little thing, these guys you may have never heard of named Carl Bernstein and Bob Woodward used anonymous sources to report on this, some story you may have never heard of called Watergate. It's important that the watchdog works, folks. When we, when we gather and corroborate facts, people get angry. People jail us. People imprison us, people hurt us. You know, the, one, the stat that stood out to me, not just that we were jailed, not just that we were hurt or killed or whatever, is that 52% of those who were jailed were jailed for covering human rights abuses. You know, like those kids who have been thrown in cages on the border because they weren't, hey, they weren't in control of the situation of immigration. It's human rights abuse. I think about my colleague, Emilio Gutierrez Soto, who was covering corruption in Mexico, fled here about a dozen years ago. And yet, because he was reporting on corruption in the Mexican military, he came here with his son seeking political asylum. Two, three years ago, we gave, the press club gave him his or Press Freedom International Award for his work. Within a couple of months of that, Immigration Customs and Enforcement snatched him up. He was petitioning, legally petitioning for asylum. And he reported like anybody else petitioning for asylum did. And when he did, they snatched him up, they threw him in a, a solitary confinement like facility, denied him medication, separated him from his son. This is our government, by the way. 
and held him for several months while press freedom groups had the petition for his release. That's your taxpayer dollars at work, folks. Luckily, we got him out for the time being, and he's studying a, a journalism fellowship in Michigan while we help him with his asylum case. Now, there's a lot of opinion journalism out there. There's a difference between what Lester Holt does and Sean Hannity. I'm not, deme I'm not demeaning Sean, because he has a right to do what he does and has a right to make a lot of money doing it, but that's not reporting. What Lester does is reporting. Too many people confuse the two. What Sean does, what, and there are other people, Maureen Dowd, if there are people who do what they do in the opinion universe, and that's fine. But when it comes to reporting, stick to Mr. Iron Pants, is what they call Lester. <laughs> what we don't do is present something without backing it up and let something just hang out there. At least, that's what we're supposed to do. Some of us fail. We're not perfect. There are a lot of, we, we're running out of time, but I want to just hit, hit on a couple of recent incidents. You can't read this, but I'll read it to you. Some things get lost in the slide translation, so I'm sorry about that. There are incidents up here to talk about local reporters. You know, you just stand out there talking about the latest developments in, in schools. I remember a man, there was a, there was a woman out uh, in Dallas who was, who was doing some reporting and a man got in a, in a car and tried to ram their live shot with a, with a moving car. When a reporter in Detroit, a man came up with a metal baton and started smashing the live truck. One of my colleagues back in DC, CBS producer Christina Ruffini, was covering the alt-right marches in, in DC, and the police and the marchers were assaulting her, shoving her around, throwing her around. Police shot one of my colleagues who's a photojournalist in Portland with a quote-unquote less than lethal round. What are you doing shooting at a news photographer? And a reporter in a, in a courtroom in New Jersey was, you know, was taking photographs in this, in this particular arena, you can, and a woman behind her slapped her in the face <laughs> while she was doing her job. And several newspapers in Ohio received threatening substances in the mail. So, I tell you, folks, it's hard being a journalist. It's hard being a lot of things. It's, harder being, it's not as hard as being a cop, not as hard as being a firefighter or a member of the military. But all we're doing is asking questions. The most perilous place for us as a journalist is being at a protest. So when you think about it, and there's a website called the Press Freedom Tracker that a bunch of us came together and started looking at these incidents. Out of 205 total results, 189 journalists affected. And just this year, it had been 78 incidents. In my, my news organization alone, in its history since 1996, we've had 11 journalists killed. And we haven't been around half the time of CBS, ABC, NBC, et cetera. So think about that, just for doing a job. And that upends families. When you're jailing a journalist, killing a journalist, harassing a journalist, kidnapping one, imagine what those days and nights are like. We talked about bias. 
45% of the people who watched the confirmation hearings of Justice, now Justice Kavanaugh thought the coverage of Benson was biased versus 20% that didn't think so. And boy, are we divided still as a country. More Democrats than Republicans. You talk about the, the debate over the Kavanaugh confirmation make you likely more to support Democratic candidates in the midterm election or more likely to support Republican candidates. You can see the numbers for yourselves. The fever chart points into basically a partisan divide. And you wonder how we can come together. I'm an optimist. So is Murphy, though. <laughs> and you know, the other line's always shorter. Doesn't always work out that way. I like to think that there's one way to sort of wrap this up and take it towards questions. And this had to do with the coverage of the Supreme Court nomination. My colleagues at Bloomberg News, there was a, put out a quick alert after the vote had been cast and he was, con and Justice Kavanaugh, was, then Judge Kavanaugh was confirmed. And my colleague, Derek Wallbank, We'll have to forgive the fact that Derek is a Michigan State graduate. He's the chair of the board of the press club right now, and my good friend. But he got this really, really tough letter from a pastor in Rhode Island. And it said, it, you know, remember this thing only had two paragraphs. And this pastor was about to address his flock on Sunday. And he really, really uh, went after Derek about saying, well, you didn't really cover him right. You didn't really do the right thing by, this is basic facts. Vote was this, he's in. <laughs> and Derek wrote him a, a lovely letter to try to calm down the waters. And he said, hi, Reverend, my, this is Derek Wallbank, head of the US government breaking news team here at Bloomberg. Thank you for reaching out. As I'm happy to hear of your concern, that I think that I can alleviate it. Indeed, if we had devoted just two paragraphs to the Kavanaugh swearing in, confirmation swearing in, that would be something. But there's far more that has and will be written. This is but one breaking news alert. Allow me to please refer you to our full story on the confirmation. And he begins to list like five or six links. <laughs> if you will permit me, I must ask a request as we all guard against misinformation. The Bible speaks often against hardening a heart. With Pharaoh as an example, the stories of Moses, and again in Hebrews 3, cautioning against the same, I do hope we in the press can count on you to let people know that the coverage here was fuller than it may have initially seen based on the reading of just one of our many pieces of coverage as one held in his grace to another, Derek. The pastor actually wrote back. Hello, Mr. Wallbank. Thank you so very much for your response. Please forgive me for my terse reaction and assuming that one tiny report was your news organization's only one. I sincerely thank you for showing me that the other articles you published, I read each one and thought they were fairly well balanced. Also, yes, you may count on me to assert to others that your organization's coverage has been much wider than I originally thought. This has also taught me to assume, as I did without researching greater, God bless you for your gracious and insightful response. All we had to do, folks, was stop and breathe. Do a little homework. And not shoot the first thing from the hip that comes to our lips. We all were taught to think before we spoke. That seems to be long gone around, <laughs> around this country. Except this room. Because you were, as my late mother would say, y'all were raised right. But think about the takeaways from this. 
We have to understand our documents, our founding documents. We have a responsibility to be kind to each other. We have a responsibility to know what we're talking about. We have a responsibility to take this precious thing called free speech and use it in a civil. We don't have to always be calm and peaceful, but we can, do, we can have spirited debates, but by God, let it even be based in facts. Because if we don't, we go right off the edge. We don't want to do that. I trust my Penn State family can prevent everybody else from getting off the edge. Can I count on you? So the next time you decide you want to turn on TV and you want to throw a brick at it, <laughs> don't. Go to the fridge. <laughs> go to the restroom. Call your best friend. Look at two or three other channels at first. Look at five other news sources. Think it through. Then pick up your smartphone or your keyboard and say something that's going to bring more light than heat. Add to the collective wisdom. That's all we ask. Because why? Because we are what? We are? We are? Thank you. All right, another round of applause for Jack. At this point, we're going to thank our online audience for tuning in and say goodbye to them until our next huddle with the faculty session. And we are going to open it up for th two or three questions for Jeff. I think there's some microphones. Carly, are there down? So, our line ambassadors. I actually, fun fact, I used to be an ambassador. Fun fact. Fun fact. <laughs> Anybody? Questions? There, over, there are some questions over here. Go for it. Should there be a, a, a centralized fact-checking organization that could immediately and uh, publicly uh, expose uh, lies and exaggerations by politicians and public figures? Good question. Um, it doesn't quite work because the business of journalism isn't quite regulated by design and isn't centralized. But I did talk about the, the, world, the, the press freedom tracker. And there are lots of websites like PolitiFact, like, uh, where is it? Here. That, that, the press freedom tracker, which is a coalition of some several dozen organ news organizations, press freedom groups like the one I used to chair, that track the number of journalists arrested incidents in terms of, where's PolitiFact? I, I love PolitiFact. The folks at the Tampa Bay, uh, down Tampa Bay, uh, have Pulitzer Prize winning PolitiFact. Now, there are people in the political arena that can't stand this website. They say, oh, it's biased, it's that, it's not. But there are sites like this that you can, if you're a Twitter follower, they do a great job of putting their, with their findings on Twitter and they're very fast about it. I hope that helps. I don't know if, we, if that we'd ever come to a centralized. Next question. I think one over here, just because I'm not seeing over, any over here. Gentleman in the hat. Hi. <laughs> Where do you think the Catholic Church story is going, or has it been handled properly or fairly? I think, uh, and you know, that I think that's a wonderful example of first-class journalism. I happen to know Marty Barron, who's currently the executive editor of the Washington Post, but he led the Spotlight team when he was at the Boston Globe that exposed the Catholic Church scandal. 
And this story just keeps getting bigger. It's, uh, I don't know where it's going. All I know is every time you look up, another archbishop is resigning. And that's sad. But it, the good thing about it is a free press is working. More and more children are hopefully being saved. More and more people whose lives are ruined are f- trying to get on the road to healing because finally there's some accountability. And that's journalism. And that's us at its best. We have time for two more questions. We'll go here and then we'll go over there. So what do you think is the root of all the anger and the rage? Because a lot of what you talked about are the symptoms or the reactions, right? Yep. What is the root cause, do you think, your opinion, right, (laughs) where all this anger and rage is coming from? I don't have a definitive answer for that, and that's the honest truth. But there are a lot of indicators. Whenever people are angry in society, they are scared, and it's usually based on the three things, economics, their sense of public safety, and their sense of self-worth. If people don't believe in themselves, remember I started with this, sticks and stones. There are consequences. If you degrade and demean people, they may strike back. They may shoot up a school. They may go on a killing rampage, you name it. If people don't think that they're earning enough at their job, they're being respected at their job, that they're getting a fair wage, they're angry, and so on and so forth. It's really basic. If you don't feel respected, you just might strike out. And people, and too many people, and sadly and unfortunately do. Paul, I think we have time for one more, right? Um, first of all, thank you for your uh, wisdom and experience in sharing it with us. And uh, thank you also for your courage for getting to where you have gotten to, my brother. I know a little bit about that, that kind of journey. I have a more personal question relative to uh, uh, information and even your news service. It, it seems to me that one of the things that Americans suffer from is a, a lack of information uh, as opposed to too much. And one of the things that I, I note is that Al Jazeera was uh, on our plate for a long while, and then now it isn't. And there's very little that comes from the international scene. Can you speak a little bit to that? Um, Yeah, sure. Well, Al Jazeera hasn't gone anywhere, uh, even though it's been around since 96 in its various forms. We have 10 channels. But but our people much higher than my pay grade uh, started what was the Al Jazeera America channel it lasted for roughly four years or so. And then it, and they, for financial and other reasons that were well publicized, there were some very horrific le- HR and leadership issues of the person we put in charge of it um, that were well documented in the New York Times and elsewhere, lawsuits and so forth, uh, where the company thought, you know, it's better to cut bait. But Al Jazeera English is available very much live stream, and very much on your app. You can watch it, in fact, right now, if you want to, (laughs) at aljazeera.com. And, well, you can't, I guess, having internet issues in here. I'm having them all morning. Um, But I I guarantee you, you, you can watch us every single day, every single hour, worldwide. Got the app right here, (laughs) so you can see us. Oh, I think that's it, unless there's any burning questions. I'm around for a bit, and I'll be around for the game and all that good stuff. Thank you so much.